Hello, everyone. Today, I'm joined by Mr. Frederick Akogane. He's the founder of Jego Technologies. How are you doing today, Fred? Doing great. Tony, thank you very much for having me on uh, your platform today. Thank you. No problem at all. My pleasure. So let's get started. What um, is Jego Technologies? Can you explain what your company does? Sure. Jego is on a mission to centralize energy using modular uh, renewable energy solutions that don't rely on the grid. Our mission is to uh, have uh, portable charges in the hands of the average individual um, to help them power their everyday lives from the electric vehicles uh, to their homes as well. Okay. And what inspired you to start this business? Um, so like every other business that I currently own or founded, it always stems from a problem first. And uh, uh, it, it actually started while we're working on that electric vehicle. Uh, well, the portable charger started while we're working on the electric vehicle um, that you see in the background. Um, but, but before we started working on that electric vehicle, we saw gaps in logistics, uh, effective logistics and product distribution and service distribution that can be automated uh, using autonomous electric vehicles. And uh, while we're working on that, we saw that there were gaps uh, in infrastructure, not just in America or in Africa, but globally, except in uh, primarily China, who dominates the electric vehicle and autonomous vehicle market. So we decided to uh, push our roadmap for the electric vehicle further down to also work on it better and focus on solving the infrastructure problem that exists within the energy sector or clean energy sector, which is um, the growing pressure that will be on the grid as more electric vehicles get on our roads. So ranging from uh, uh, sedans, electric vehicles, to freight trucks, motorcycles, and the rest. So there'll be, there's expected pressure on the grid. So um, players in this space are looking to create products that don't uh, rely on the grid. And Jago at the moment uh, is one of two companies that have portable electric vehicle chargers. Interesting. And can you clarify the difference between autonomous autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles? Yeah, certainly. Uh, so well, autonomous vehicles, the term there and what that focuses on is uh, a vehicle that drives itself to keep the language simple there for the average person. Um, and it's powered by uh, autonomous vehicle with its own uh, uh, processing system that allows the vehicle to um, operate independently of a driver. However, there are different levels of autonomous, um, autonomous vehicles and it ranges from zero to five at the moment. And most autonomous vehicles you see on the roads today, like Tesla, for example, is really on the level three, level four. Um, and most vehicles don't have the full FSD. However, recently the US government um, uh, removed that requirement of having human uh, a human supervisor uh, behind uh, the vehicle while it was operating. So that's a difference, or well, that's what an autonomous vehicle is. An electric vehicle can be autonomous and it also can be an ICE vehicle, which is an internal combustion engine vehicle. So yeah, that is the difference. Most times these days, they are primarily the same um, thing. So whether, for example, a Tesla is an autonomous and electric vehicle. Uh, the EQS is an autonomous electric vehicle as well. So it's basically uh, where the uh, mobility world overall is going, not just with cars, but you're yeah. talking about uh, bikes, motorcycles, uh, freight trucks. Jago, for example, signed um, a, a partnership with uh, a South African um, electric motorcycle company um, to provide uh, modular energy solutions, which again helps reduce carbon emissions on a mass level I'm um, in Africa. So we have two other companies in the African continent, one on the West and another on the East that also do the same thing. So we're excited to partner with companies similar to that. For any other others that exist or are similar to that, we're excited and open to partner with them because we believe by doing that, we'll make it easier to deploy um, electric vehicles and make electric vehicles more accessible as well to the masses, um, which as a result fits into our plan of driving uh, um, adoption of electric vehicles and again, decentralizing energy. 
in terms of production, where are you? Have you um, are the batteries ready to go, and or are the vehicles ready? So what's ready now, and what's the time sure. for the others? Sure. So we started with our level two charges that go on your walls or your um, on a pedestal, and those are ready. Those are production ready, and uh, we decided to focus on the portable um, charges, which will be um, on the market by December. That's our target right now. And we'll be having like a trade show and all that stuff uh, to display uh, how it works. So that's our current production ready um, product. The vehicles, just like most electric and autonomous vehicles, take a couple of years before they get to commercial level. So like in, in uh, software development or technology development, product development in general, you have phases. So you have the R&D phase and you have the development phase and you have the testing phase and you have the uh, prototype phase, et cetera. And then production. So you have to go through all these rigorous phases, which on the vehicle side costs hundreds of millions and goes into a billion to do before you actually get to a commercial level. So we are, uh, we're focused on um, uh, creating quality product and uh, we are not rushing our process. And we believe that by uh, exploring, exploring our um, energy prowess, uh, for example, um, that will give us uh, an advantage. Um, and that's the same technology that we can put into our vehicle to give us a long-term um, competitive advantage in the immobility space. In terms of mainstream adoption, like right now in here in the US, we don't see you know autonomous vehicles like roaming the streets, like your everyday car. What regions or countries are kind of like further ahead when it comes to adoption of this type of vehicle? Um, well, Europe and China, well, China first, uh, in the sense of a country, but countries in the European continent um, as well, um, such as Netherlands, uh, Germany. Germany was the first, I believe, first country to give or approve robo-taxis uh, to have free roam. So the majority of European countries are have always been sustainable about sustainability for, for quite some time. Um, I actually worked with some companies uh, years back. One was in the Netherlands, um, another one was in Italy as well that were in the mobility space. So uh, that's actually where I got my inspiration for sustainability, to be honest, um, seeing how they created them. And again, I'm a minimalist and I, uh, it's something I believe that adds strong value to um, ecosystems and communities. So I would say China is a leader in that space. And I mean, for example, they have 2 million public charging stations for electric vehicles. And uh, America has 100,000 and under. I mean, like half of that, half of those are not working. And the Biden administration recently, uh, you know, released a statement about 500,000 charges by 2030. Uh, so you look at that, those numbers, you compare it to what China currently has, that's by the fact that China has a larger population, of course, but when you look at the number of electric vehicles that will be on the road by 2030, it's tens of millions of electric vehicles, 500,000 will nowhere be enough to uh, suffice, which is again why we see the opportunity to decentralize energy using modular solutions. So what we envision is uh, we're starting, what we're starting with the portable chargers, and once the vehicle's on the road, when they bring services, as you can see, they have seats in the um, a big enough space for you to stand in. So they bring services and products to you. So while that service or product is being delivered to you, you can also request to have your vehicle charged using the Jego part battery in the vehicle. So reverse charging, same thing for your home as well. So that is that is our plan, our roadmap, and um, we're confident in um, the execution. So apart from selling the um, the portable batteries and I guess the vehicles as well, are there other streams of income or revenue that are associated with the business? Um, they are, but some of them are kind of part of our, at this stage, I can't share them just yet. Uh, but what we do plan on doing in the long term, which is not is most um, players' aspiration in the space is controlling our manufacturing at on some level or partnering with micro factories because that will help us with our supply chain issues and being able to um, create or 
products quicker or at least have control of that and we know what's going on as opposed to being at the mercy of different suppliers and different and also their markups are usually significantly higher um, when it, especially when it comes to uh, the labor part right yeah controlling that supply chain is key yeah yeah <laughs> and especially for us we are goals to have them in africa and also just i mean major of the, of the industry is using lithium iron and other um, um materials for their batteries and we we have a, a particular product that we've been introduced to that can um give us a competitive advantage, which allows the batteries to charge in minutes as opposed to hours. So uh, those are some of the things we're working on. Awesome, yeah, keep, keep that close to the chest. Uh, <laughs> what are some challenges that you see when like facing, like spreading the gospel of AV um, autonomous vehicles? Because like right now, again, it's not, you're like ahead of the curve and it's not like it hasn't been adopted in a mainstream way. What are some challenges that you see, like some arguments you hear like, oh, it's not, safe or I don't want to be in a car and there's no driver, that type of thing. Like, how are you overcoming those type of conversations? Um, data to start with. I always tell, like, I, part of my inspiration for the vehicle was experiencing a tragic incident. Mm -hmm. um, so a loved one being lost to uh, a car accident. So the data is there. That's the DOT has this out there when, for um, folks who want to understand autonomous vehicles better. 94% uh, of car accidents are caused by human error. So that's usually my most common answer. I don't usually go into arguments about the benefits of autonomous vehicles. I should just share that data. And statistically, the data shows that autonomous vehicles are safer on the roads than human drivers. Because first of all, you have sensors, cameras all around the vehicles uh, and most of the vehicles that get to commercial level have gone through rigorous testing um, on private roads before they get on public roads. So by the time they're on public roads, it's already aware. Um, I mean, it's gone through simulation environment. It's gone through that road like 10,000 times and hundreds of thousands of hours before it's released on the road. So uh, as opposed to a, a driver test, it takes a couple of weeks and then in some cases, in certain states like Florida and Miami, you have drivers who never learn how to drive. So that's, I mean, and also for my exact for myself, I've had a level three autonomous vehicle, and what I observed for me as a human driver, it felt like a teacher after a while. It showed me how to hold my hand on a certain curve, and the exact way to like, you know, just basically made me a better driver. So that showed me that the car even knew more about driving in certain parts because you have to still hold the steering wheel so you're thinking muscle memory so after a while i became used to that um that um pattern or that uh, motion uh, so that was my observation and data that i collected as a uh, as a uh, player in the space that's valuable data and uh, i believe the autonomous vehicles are better for us overall again it's about mobility that's what this is about right the distribution of people, products, and services. And I believe autonomous vehicles are poised and in a better position to handle that better than humans, which is the reason we, why we actually even started Jago 2 was we didn't want, we want to remove the human driver mm -hmm. and have replace it with like human concierge and uh, like do more with that person, have them be more productive, whether you're in the car driving, because we will release personal vehicles beyond commercial in the future. So more productivity and entertainment and just doing more with your time, or if it's in a commercial vehicle, it's a concierge or an attendant that's selling services and products in there. So we're removing the human driver so you can do more as opposed to while you're driving, even though I, I love driving, but most of the time I would prefer to have, have that done by um, a technology that can you're a busy save guy. me time. Productive. Yeah, you got things to do, I get it. So one thing that um, came to mind was you mentioned that this is a very, it's a capital intensive, I guess, uh, industry. What are you doing right Indeed. now to raise money for uh, the projects that you're working on? Yeah, so it is very capital intensive. Um, on average to get, uh, I mean, this is, you have to raise billions over time, depending on how big you want to to get, and I say raise, but you invest in that, you're building products and you're increasing your revenue numbers and all that. 
Um, what we've done so far, we've raised from angel investors, venture partners. We've also, we did have a, a crowd funding campaign that was on Start Engine and that raised about 140. So we've raised in total, uh, well, I can't really disclose that because of the SEC regulations, but crowdfunding is public. So we're raising uh, 2.2 for our pre-seed and uh, we've pretty much had uh, some offers, some were not in our favor in the sense of them wanting to have more board seats or uh, just more control of the company. And uh, I was, you know, basically just, I'm a businessman and invest in myself. So just the same way I choose to, like what business I'm investing in, I choose what investors I want to work with. Because sure. I believe in business, every person you work with, it's like a marriage, it's long term. You want to make sure that you enjoy the journey with that person. Yeah. So. Uh, that's where we are right now. We are accepting investments from angel investors and but primarily focus on venture capital. Those are the conversations we've been having and we've been approached by VCs. Um, actually, I have another one later today. Um, so, but we're making good progress in that area. And um, yeah. Okay. Well, um, first of all, good luck with that call that you have later on. Um, what I wanted to also ask was, you mentioned doing work in... Uh, so African countries, what um, specifically is Jego doing in, I think it's Nigeria and somewhere else or? Um, so yeah, it's pretty much our solutions are, uh, can be deployed across the continent. And, and I can't share too much on our plan surrounding that area, but uh, what we're doing is again, decentralizing energy using a portable charge that you can see to power not just your vehicle, but your, your uh, homes as well. And uh, yeah, that's what we're currently uh, doing in, in Africa. And we believe that way, you know, there's more productivity. Um, as it was actually a recent uh, event that took place, we were supposed to hire, because we have a couple of engineers, a few engineers from the African continent. And we believe in doing that to create opportunities to earn, which leads to more freedom for them to invest in themselves, family, and their own vision. It's a domino effect, exactly. which is why energy is important. Um, there was an engineer we were supposed to hire. We were offered him the job, and he had to um, delay his start in time because he's not had access to power for a few weeks. Mm -hmm. And in a recent meeting I had with our board and a financing partner, and actually a member of the Nigerian presidency, um, what was uh, shared was just there were representatives from three different countries on the African continent in that meeting. And what I just kept hearing was how the grid, basically, each country was just sharing how theirs was worse. Yeah. Uh, one was Nigeria was like, you know, South Africa was complaining and then Nigeria was like, ha, you, th you think you have worse in Liberia? It's like, we have some places don't have power for months. So if we're talking about bringing the EVs or bringing EVs to Africa, we can't even talk about that. We don't even have a reliable grid, yeah. which is why, yeah. again, Jago is focused on decentralizing energy. I, we that, that was again on our journey. We wanted to bring the vehicles to Africa because Jago is an African word inspired by African goddess of commerce, Yoruba goddess of commerce to be more exact, and marketplace. So we've always been about Africa and just deploying our solutions and creating our solutions in Africa. So um, that is pressing to us because when I visited recently in December, I saw how that impacts everybody, not just the low income earners or you know everyone's been impacted all businesses have been impacted and the cost of diesel these days is actually driving the desire and the need urgently not a casual need or a fleeting need it's an urgent need and it's you know we're talking about different institutions that right now are interested in working with us to to create and deploy this um, we also spoke with uh yeah but you know we're 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 really focused on 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 that decentralizing energy. Okay. And lastly, where do you where do you see the company in five years from now? Um. Well, five years from now, we'll definitely our goal five years from now is to have the average EV owner uh, to own a Jaguar Pod power pod. That's what we call them, okay. the chargers. And also we expect to have our vehicle, you know, on the roads um, in certain key cities, cities, um, whether Africa or in America, that's what we're currently working on. Right. 
And I guess the last, last question, what do you think right now would help take your business to the next level? Um, just like most businesses, um, especially black owned businesses, we're on shop black. So most black founders, especially for me, I'm the first black man, black person really to go speak to banks about raising money for the company of this, um, with this products. And um, I've faced challenges where I've had, you know, people tell me I, I should have a white CTO or white CEO mm. of the company. So there's certain things I have to, which is, I'm used to that challenge in the status quo uh, to get the results that I want. I, you know, um, not deterred by that at all, but some of those challenges is actually having to change narratives and having to over qualify myself, even though I've been in tech since I was, my whole life since I was 14. Um, I'm more qualified than the majority of the technical founders or founders that are in our space. And um, yeah, that's one of the biggest challenges that I've come across is having to um, basically qualify myself a lot, especially when it's something I have to do it more than I should. Um, and I believe most black founders deal with that, you know, or having to deal with the goalposts being moved uh, sometimes um, with uh, VCs, um, which is okay. We you get to you know get this prototype, we get you get you the funding, or get this. Now you want the vehicle on the road, and everyone knows it takes hundreds of millions of dollars to get the vehicle on the road. You know, I haven't raised that amount of money, so it's like those kind of uh, tactics uh, that I've been that I've witnessed, but we also have a lot of supporters and a lot of people that believe in the vision and we're currently uh, in the phase of closing this round out. And yeah, if anyone wants to get in, they can reach out to me and uh, yeah, this is where we are. So basically the most pressing need right now is for capital, you know, I guess as always, is there anything else like follow um, social media? They can follow us on social media. Um, we have quite a community on social media, about 12,700 uh, or so. But, and that just shows people believe in the product and our mission. Um, and it was very intentional from the beginning to build that uh, community in, within our ecosystem because we believe that sustainability cannot exist without community. And within that has to be equitable. Right. And that's, our, that's in our DNA from day one, again, which is why our business was inspired by Ajay, the Jago, um, the goddess of commerce and marketplace. The marketplace in Africa is about community and ecosystem. Everyone's working together. Everyone has value um, that they're contributing to that ecosystem. So that's why we designed that from day one. And that's how we plan to keep it going, which is why when you decentralize it, it, uh, it thrives and continues to run long after the original founders existed. And that's our plan with Jago. Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks for stopping by, Frederick. Thanks for sharing the information about your company and best of luck with all your future plans. Thank you very much, Tony. I really appreciate you having me on Shelf Black. No problem at all. Take care. Take care.